Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Hope you're having a blessed day. Happy Today, Sabbath. Today, we're teaching with Scott and Barbara and myself. And the lesson is the crucibles that come. Oh, boy, this sounds like a good lesson. It is. But before we begin, Scott, could you open in prayer for us? Sure. Dear Heavenly Father, we wanted to thank you for this privilege of studying your word together. Father, um, we don't normally like crucibles, but they're good for us. So we hope that through this lesson, we learn to appreciate the good that Amen. Thank you, Scott. All right, so what is a crucible? We've heard the word before, right? The lesson says, a vessel used for melting a substance that requires a high degree of heat. The second definition, a severe test, or the third, a place or situation in which concentrated forces interact to cause or influence change or development. We're going to see how all three of these definitions actually apply to today's lesson. So regardless of who starts or allows it, whether it's God, the devil, or ourselves, it can be a painful and traumatic experience and or one of the best things that's ever happened to us, or both. <laughs> Let's read the memory verse for today. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at, revelation, at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. You know, I had a buddy in college before my church and SDA days and all that. And one week, he got a DUI, lost his job, and his girlfriend broke up with him. Some week, huh? Mm. The, the Sunday's lesson is about surprises. You think he had a few? Couple. Yeah, just a few, all in one week. Was he rejoicing? Most definitely not. Did he expect any of this? Not even close. Do you think he saw anything good from it? No, nah, not a chance. And yet I tell you, he stopped drinking for the most part, which was a complete change for him, saving him from a path that he really should avoided in the uh, have <coughs> avoided in the first place. He did get another job eventually, but between that and all the fees with his DUI, he learned to be a lot more frugal and manage his money significantly better. And the girl that broke up with him, well, after a few years went by, because that one kind of got him at first, and after seeing some character traits that she possessed over time, he was kind of thankful that she did. So I think of this example, though, and I see a lot of it in today's lesson. The surprise, the crucible of sin that's self-inflicted, and the crucibles of purification and letting go of some very destructive habits, definitely. We don't necessarily see the crucibles of Satan, but all we have to do is look in the Bible. And we can look at either Job, we see plenty there, right? Or even in Luke 22, 31 through 32, when Jesus says to, to Peter, when he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail and you one, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Now, why would Satan cause a crucible? Why did he want to sift him like wheat? And we actually see this later on when, when Peter denies Christ three times. What was his purpose? Well, one, to separate him from that relationship with God that leads to salvation the only thing the devil can do to hurt God, really, is by through his children. And second was to stop Peter from, from doing Christ's will here on earth and proclaiming the gospel. We will see in today's lesson 
just how powerful our own sin can be. It's like a crucible-making machine. It is. I see it with myself every day. In the Bible, from King David to Jonah to Balaam, and let's not forget the children of Israel, over and over and over again, just to name a few. All crucibles wrought by their own hands. In Wednesday's lesson, we're going to see how the refiner's fire can separate the pure gold or silver from the dross that pollutes it. Truly our cardinal nature, exposing sins one didn't even know existed. But once exposed, beginning the process of eradication. That is the only death that God really wants to see for us is the death of our sin. And on Thursday, we'll see just how God helps us stay on the straight and narrow path with him. It's one thing to have a crucible to stop a sinful behavior. It's another to have a crucible to prevent the sin in the first place, like Paul's thrown in the flesh. And Barbara's going to tell us about that. But one may ask, why? Why all this pain and suffering to learn? Is there any other way than a crucible way? Let me ask you something. When was the last time you changed your character based on the advice from someone? I'm going to guess almost never. I know for me. It's because of our carnal flesh and our desire to sin that we have to, it apparently seems we have to suffer to learn. Christ knew this because he knew our condition. He, this is why the sinless flesh had to live in a sinful world with grief and sorrow and pain because he is our example to follow to salvation. He had our solution to the sin problem. He just had to present it in a way that we would save us truly think of it this way you have a deadly cancer intertwined through your entire body bonded with your flesh in all areas what do you think it will take to surgically remove that cancer a day a week years let me ask you this how do you think each procedure is going to feel and yet this is what we need to do if we're going to have the character here on earth that is prepared for heaven. Like reprimanding a child that, that is no real malice intended, God doesn't have anything ill will toward us. It's really for the good of us, his children on this earth. So with us, our Father in heaven and Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit all wanted to take us home from the perils of the sin to the heavenly sanctuary, to the heavenly eternity, and to be with him forever. And as we look at this, Scott, can you tell us about Sunday's lesson, Surprises? Yeah, thank you, Byron. So, um, unfortunately, the kind of surprise they're talking about here is not the kind of surprise I like. I like surprise presents, surprise birthday parties, those kinds of surprises, positive surprises, but this seems like it's using the word surprise in a negative term. And in fact, I think in the Bible it's translated as strange. So, beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing had happened to you. So then it says, surprises, painful surprises, can come in many ways a car veering across the road into your path, a sudden notification that you're losing your job, a medical test that gives you unexpected bad news, betrayal by someone you loved or thought you loved. As bad as the pain can be, it can always be made worse by the element of surprise. Um, the week, this week, we'll look at a few specific types of painful situations. To begin with, um, let's go back to the text in Peter. The Greek word for surprised is also means alien or foreign. Um, and personally, I'd like to keep it alien and foreign, this kind of surprise. Peter is urging this reader not to fall into the trap of believing that the fiery ordeals and trials are alien to the Christian experience. Rather, they are to be considered normal. They can and should be expected. The word used for fiery ordeal or fiery trial comes from the Greek word, um, from another Greek word, which means a burning. In other words, 
can be translated as a furnace. The experience of suffering for our faith could therefore be considered a smelting process, the process of the crucible. So now it's asking us to read the whole verse from Peter. Um, and so in First Peter um, 4, 12 through 19, it says, Do not think it strange for, uh, concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing had happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this manner. For, as the, time, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God, and if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now if the righteous um, one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those also who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. So uh, one of the questions that's um, inspired here, um, actually then I'll also read Job 21.7. It says, why do the wicked live and become old? Yes, uh, become mighty in power. In other words, why do good people suffer while the wicked are seeming to prosper? This is likely one of the most commonly used arguments against Christianity by those who cannot believe that the innocent would suffer in a world where God is in charge and he is all-powerful. The best answer to the question is offered by the life of Christ himself. Um, the innocent one suffered so that he could save the guilty, or at least the guilty who want to be saved. Christ suffered more than any other man uh, because his suffering was intensified by the knowledge that he had the power to deliver himself and to miserably punish his enemies, which is not something you and I have the power to do. So Christ demonstrated his um, power as he cast out the demons from the two men on the shores of Gennesaret. So I believe Christ could have easily directed the demons to go and torment his enemies instead of the herd of the pigs, uh, and the demons would have had no choice but to obey. Um, so um, then I, as I was reading along in the spirit of prophecy, I also found that there was... Uh, a paragraph in chapter one of Patriarchs and Prophets out of the chapter called Why Was Evil Permitted that kind of gives a little bit of insight into this, though I, I don't think we'll ever fully understand everything, but this gives us a little bit of a glimpse. So it says, even when he was cast out of heaven, that is, he is Satan, infinite wisdom did not destroy Satan. Since only the surface service of love can be acceptable to God, the allegiance of his creatures must rest upon a conviction of his justice and benevolence. The inhabitants of heaven and of the worlds, being unprepared to comprehend the nature or consequences of sin, could not have been seen justice in God in the destruction of Satan. Had he been immediately blotted out of existence, some would have served God from fear rather than from love. The influence of the deceiver would not have been fully destroyed, nor would the spirit of rebellion have been utterly eradicated. For the good of the entire universe through ceaseless ages, he must more fully develop his principles, uh, that his charges against the divine government might be seen in their true light by all created beings and that the justice and mercy of God and the immutability of his law 
might forever be placed beyond all question. So I, I think this is a, a great insight into um, why the innocent are allowed to suffer is because God is allowing evil to come to its fruition. Um, otherwise, it would not have been seen as the bad thing that it is. So Lucifer being um, so intelligent, um, artfully cloaked his um, words so that it sounded good. For example, in what he told Eve, so the day that you eat thereof, you will not die. That was a half-truth, but it made it sound like they were going to become like God in, in becoming like him in power, not in becoming like him in that they would know what evil is. So God tried to withhold the evil part from Eve and Adam. Um, I'm also, am I out of time? <laughs> oh, okay. I'm also reminded of the, the um, Stoic philosophers. Um, so the story of Zeno is basically that his, all of his ship, uh, all of, he was a merchant and all of his ships were um, destroyed at one time. So he went from being very wealthy to being basically homeless. So um, in this course of this event, he was able to uh, persevere through it, and he started the school of philosophy known as Stoicism, which basically um, was summed up by Ryan Holiday as um, the obstacle is the way. So I think that is a good lesson for us to have as well. So when we see an obstacle, meaning a fiery trial, um, we need to realize that this is part of our training. So just like an athlete needs to go through um, exercise, which is uncomfortable and difficult, we need to go through the exercise of um, the fiery trials. So in conclusion, Peter's admonition to rejoice when we are unjustly persecuted for Christ runs contrary to our human nature, but this is the key to eternal life. Christ himself said that he who seeks to save his life will lose it, but he who is willing to lose his life for Christ will gain it. Amen. Okay. I, know, I love that. It, it's, well, the surprises sneak up on you, but life can change like that in a moment. And then you have to ask yourself sometimes too, God, why is this happening to me? At least you learn after a while, hopefully. Yeah, and I think we only like good <laughs> surprises. We don't really like the kind of surprises they're talking about. True. Barbara, the crucibles of Satan. Can you tell us about this bad man and how God uses it for good? <laughs> yes, let's talk about these crucibles. First of all, the scripture teaches us that behind the scenes of earthly affairs, invisible supernatural forces, both good and evil, are engaged in cosmic warfare for the allegiance and control of every human being. I think we've all experienced that battle. Ephesians 6, 12 tells us, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The scriptures <clears throat> teach us of a literal personal devil once called Lucifer. Isaiah 12, 14, 12 says, how art, thou how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? And now named Satan, who has the highest rank and is, was the most beautiful angel in heaven. And so it's, it's sad to see <clears throat> that he had that position, but now has turned into something else. In fact, Ezekiel 28 says, you were perfect in all your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. Satan decided he wanted to be God. He wanted to be worshiped, and he will do whatever he can to trap mankind. Many people think the devil is not real, but I beg to differ. He's alive and well. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion walking about, seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in faith, knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. 
<clears throat> but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a little while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So let's take a look at <clears throat> this verse 8, this roaring lion. So I want to look at, at some, some components of, of lions and what they're about. First of all, the lion is the king of the beasts. And what's interesting about lions is a lot, most of their hunting is done at night and in different kinds of habitats. So they're not <clears throat> stuck in one habitat when they go to find their prey. And it's interesting because Colossians 1.13 tells us, he has delivered us from the power of darkness, Christ has, and conveyed us into the kingdom of his son. So we see that Christ has what can protect us from this darkness of this lion who is trying, this lion Satan who is trying to get us and attack us. Also, like social animals, lions have roles that they assign in their packs. So they run in packs. A pride of lions typically consists of a group of female lions or a lioness, a few younger cubs that are descendants of the male lion. The male lion has a role of being protector of the pride, fending off potential dangers they may, that may threaten the pride. So Satan as the lion is directing his pride um, or his, his, his group of angels, minions. his minions, absolutely. But most people are not familiar with the fact that the lionesses are the primary hunters in the lion pack. Though female lions may be physically smaller than the male lions, they make up for it in speed. They are, in fact, 30% faster than the male lions, reaching up to speeds of 45 miles an hour. Additionally, lionesses hunt together in packs, which effectively increases their chances to capture their prey. So, in general, there are two known methods for lions in the way they hunt. The first is by stalking. So the, they, they like to stay hidden as long as possible while they approach the prey. There is another advantage that the lioness has over the male in that their bodies are slimmer, allowing them to stay hidden in the grass longer. Lionesses also work together when they hunt by surrounding their prey <clears throat> And um, they all come at this prey. They all stay hidden and come at the prey from different angles. So they often attack, crush the necks, and leave them paral paralyzed to be taken back home to feed the rest of the group. So this sounds pretty, pretty brutal, doesn't it? Yeah. But sa so, Satan behaves, behaves, behaves in the same way. A lot of times they'll actually choke them and suffocate them and start <clears throat> eating them alive as well. Yeah. So that's, that's the first way they hunt. The second way they hunt is by hiding, not hiding, and going at the bigger prey head on. And they strategically corner the prey. And once he's cornered, the lion face to face has to fight the animal. In this scenario, the weight of brute strength and bravery of the lion is what will determine the outcome of the hunt. So we see S Satan using a lot of these same tactics with humans. Peter says that Satan is prowling around this, in, this, in this way too. We look around, we can see the consequences of his desire to kill, death, suffering, and twisting, Perverting of morals and values are everywhere. We cannot escape the work of Satan. In verse 5-9, the same affection, afflictions are accomplished in your brethren and in the world. So Satan has an organized, intelligent army of demons that work in an organized way that the, that the lions do. We see glimpses of this when Christ meets the demoniac. And we know the story of the demoniac, that Christ had just come off a ship, and this man comes running out to meet him. And uh, 
we'll pick up in verse 4. Because he had often been bound with fetters and chains, and the chain had been plucked by him asunder, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. So this man was wild, he was strong, and he was out of control. And so when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What? Have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou not torment me. So we can see here it's not the man talking oh. to Jesus, but it's the demons. And, and Christ said to him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is his name? And this is what is really the important piece that I want to bring out uh, right now in the lesson. And he said, My name is Legion for we are many. So we see Satan's angel working in legions and in coordinated attacks upon us. Matthew 12, 44 and 45 says, Then he saith, I will return to my house from whence I came out, and when findeth it empty and swept and garnished, he goes in and taketh himself seven more spirits from whence he came out. So we see that, that they are strategic They're, they'll come back and check out the situation to see if they can harass or, or or bother you some more peter writes these words in context of in peter 10 and 11 we see the the same context of responding to satan's attacks in the christian faith but as we have mentioned satan is at work in many different ways and although we must be aware of the reality and the power of our enemy, we must never get discouraged. Ellen White says, Henceforward, Christ's followers are to look upon Satan as a conquered foe. Upon the cross, Jesus was to gain the victory for them. That victory he desired them to accept as their own. Behold, he said, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. The Savior is by the side of his tempted and tried ones. There are Christians who think and speak altogether too much about the power of Satan. They think that their adversary, they pray about him, they talk about him, and he looms up greater and greater in their imagination. Is it true that Satan is a powerful being? But thank God we have a mighty Savior who cast out the evil from heaven. Satan is pleased when we magnify his power. So why not talk about Jesus and Jesus' power more? So even though Satan <clears throat> comes at us and we have struggles, our battle is not with him and not with others, but our battle is on our knees in prayer. Thank God we have a Savior who can take him like that. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. You're welcome. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to go to Tuesday's lesson, Crucibles of Sin. And we're going to read Romans 1, 18 through 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood um, through what has been made so that they are without excuse. And I love this verse because even so many times we see people worship nature or creation but not the creator, right? So, we can understand from this, though, that everyone in the world has an understanding of right and wrong. True? I mean, we see tribes in the Amazon that have never had contact with the outside world. And yet, they know words like good and bad. They know what murder is. How could they know this? Because God writes his law on their hearts. No one is innocent. We all know what is right and wrong. We all know that God's law, the Ten Commandments, was written there. So we've learned from the previous lessons 
about in Jeremiah 31, 33, or 33 and Hebrews 10, 16. We see scripture mentioning this. So let me ask you, what are the wages of sin? Death. And we know this because for uh, Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, it's clear enough. We're going to come back to that free gift part in the very end. But what death is that then? Is that the death that they face at judgment at the second death? Well, that would be true, right? But let's look because it's so much more. There is no escaping the byproducts of sin. I know, Scott, it mentioned earlier that, oh, you see, and even in Proverbs, it mentions that, um, oh, you see the wicked prosper in all these things. But yet they still do. It's rare that anyone escapes this life without a little, little coming back on, on, on them. So what goes around comes around. So we see sometimes immediately the consequences of sin right away. And other times it's a slow process of growth before the sin comes to full circle. That reap what you sow. I've watched people in this life experience both. But let's take a look at the Bible. Let's see what God has to say. You remember David and Bathsheba, right? So David's on the palace when he should be out at war. He's actually looking off the rooftop and he sees Bathsheba. Has her brought up there. They lie together because he's the king. And soon enough, she, she discovers she's with child. So... Now he has Uriah the Hittite brought back from war, her husband, to lie with her so that he can cover his sin, but he won't do it. Actually, the Bible kind of indicates Uriah the Hittite is a better man than David. So he's still trying to conceal his sin. And it's interesting how one lie leads to another, especially when you're trying to cover up sin. And yet another and another. It's a never-ending phase until you're caught. So finally, less than a year later, convicted by God through Nathan, a prophet, Satan, or David's sin is called out, right? And the baby that Bathsheba has is basically killed by God. That's a whole other lesson. But we see literally the immediate or more so immediate effects of that sin, of that crucible that comes about from it. But we see also other seeds that are planted during this time that have a lot of time to grow. And you might say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, let's read 2 Samuel 12, and actually chapter 12, verses 9 through 13. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me, and that's God, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. So we can be forgiven and God can wipe away that sin if we repent, but we see this prophecy, we see these seeds planted and this prophecy starting to grow. What do we see later? One of David's sons, Ammon, he rapes his half-sister Tamar. What do you think David does? Nothing. Absalom, Tamar's brother, kills Ammon for this at a later time. What does David do? Nothing. David's sin is he puts his family, he cannot reprimand his family, and he puts them before God. And it keeps growing. Absalom judges the people at the gate of Jerusalem. Remember, he used to have the 50 runners before his chariot? 
and all these things and usurping his father, the king. And David does nothing. Full-blown civil war erupts and a coup against the palace. David runs for his life. We read in 2 Samuel 18.7 how 20,000 men fell in the battle. What does David do? At this point in time, before they fight, he says, and I'm going to read this from 2 Samuel 18.12. He says, the man said to Joab, this is after Absalom is caught in the tree by his hair because it's so thick and full. And he's stuck. The man said to Joab, even if I should receive a thousand pieces of silver in my hand, I would not put out my hand against the king's son. For in our hearing, the king charged you and Ab Abishai and Atae, saying, protect for me the young man Absalom. So even when his life is threatened, David cannot bring himself to reprimand or do anything against his own family. The sin of Absalom took time to grow a long time by David's sowing, but when it was harvested, it was far worse than the original seed that was scattered. Other examples would be Balaam, King Uzziah. Remember when he wanted to burn incense in the temple and he got leprosy? That was very immediate, etc. We see Ellen White writes in Sharing the Vision, and this has to do specifically with the crucibles of sin. She writes, The warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. The yielding of self, surrendering all to the will of God, requires a struggle, but the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. Until that happens, we are our own worst enemy. You would, might have Satan attacking you. You might have God trying to purify you and, and teach you how to be better. But without us accepting any of that, we are doomed for failure. So we're going to get to that part about the good part, right? What we read earlier about, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We know that God's law, and it was called the Torah, right? We think of law as punitive or, as Jesus put it, the Gentiles lorded over you with that authoritarian. But you realize the word Torah means instruction. These are instructions for our life. These are the key to us having at least minimizing the crucibles of sin that we create ourselves. Now, yes, the Satan... Crucibles will pick up. God's crucibles will pick up. But at least we will stop being our own worst enemy. And I hope all of us can take that by the reins and run with it. Scott, can you tell us about Wednesday, crucibles of purification? So Wednesday's lesson talks about the cru crucibles of purification. So um, it says... Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will refine them and try them, for I shall deal with the daughter of my, for how shall I deal with the daughter of my people? And then one of the quotes from um, the lesson says, If the Spirit of God brings to your mind a word of the Lord that hurts you, you can be sure that there is something he wants to hurt to the point of death. And so that reminded me of one of the stories that um, when I was reading in the great controversy about William Miller, it said that he had this burden to share the light that he had about Bible prophecy to the point that it wasn't letting him sleep at night. Um, and he was worried that if he didn't warn the wicked, then God would require their blood at his hand. Um, but uh, he was faithful to his conviction and even at great personal cost to his both his finances and his reputation he was willing to share the message um, and another one that another bible story that seemed like it's apropos to this um, situation was the literal crucible built by Nebuchadnezzar where um, since Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego refused to bow down to his image, um, they were literally thrown in a, in a fire. 
but the only thing that burned in that fire was the rope that bound them. Um, and they had another uh, positive benefit of this, which is that they met Christ in the midst of the fire, that God was glorified by their deliverance, and in the end they received a promotion. Um, however, it must have been scary at the beginning in that they didn't know the outcome, so they could have easily died from this. Um, so now let's go back and read the verses here from Jeremiah uh, 9, 7 through 16. Uh, Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will refine them and try them. For how shall I deal with the daughter of my people? Their tongue is an arrow shot out. It speaks deceit. One speaks peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth, but in his heart he, uh, he lies in wait. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? Shall I, shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? I will take up a weeding, weeping and wailing for the mountains and for the dwelling places of the wilderness a lamentation because they are burned up so that no one can pass through nor can men hear the voice of their cattle. Both the birds of the heavens and the beasts have fled. They are gone. I will make Jerusalem a heap of ruins, a den of jackals. I will make the cities of Judah desolate without an inhabitant. Who is the wise man who may understand this? And who is he to whom the mouth of the Lord has spoken that he may declare it? Why does the land perish and burn up like a wilderness so that no one can pass through? And the Lord said, because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice, nor walked according to it, but they have walked according to the dictates of their own hearts, after the Baals, which their fathers taught them. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will feed them this people with wormwood, and give them the water of gall to drink. I will scatter them among the Gentiles, whom uh, neither they nor their fathers had known, and I will send a sword until I have consumed them. So, but yet even, even in this seemingly tough situation for, for the people of Israel, the, the interesting part is that God was still able to maintain his plan of salvation. So, um, it seems pretty obvious that Lucifer's plan had been that the Jews should themselves become so corrupted that God couldn't use them to bring Messiah out of a, a corrupted people such as the people of Israel. And yet God, through the crucible of purification, he was able to um, still get the Messiah out. So even though they killed the Messiah, still he made it onto the planet and was able to offer salvation to all of us, um, even though the people of Israel themselves were not faithful. Uh, and I think that's a good, good lesson for us to learn as well, in that um, I think God can work either through our, um, uh, through our humiliation or through our exaltation, and we get the choice of which one. So, the more we obey him, the less there will be for the fire to burn away from, from ourselves. Um, now there's another verse that was mentioned here that was Jeremiah 6.29. The bellows blow fiercely. The lead is consumed by the fire. The smelter refines in vain, for the wicked are not drawn off. So I think the second part of this lesson I'm also trying to um, give some illustrations here, which is th there was a song by Amy Grant which says the same sun which um, melts the wax will harden clay. So I think we have several examples in the Bible where um, there were two people that were in very similar circumstances where one of them is hardened against God and the other one is melted towards God. So for example, if we look at the examples of Esau and Jacob, it seems like between the two of them, Jacob was the more treacherous one who lied to his father and tried to steal the birthright from his brother. 
but God knew his heart, so he was able to melt away the, um, uh, shall we say, the selfish and grasping elements from Jacob's life and make him uh, more like Jesus so that he was able to become the father of the nation of the faithful. Or then with the example of Saul or David. Saul seemed like his, at least his first sin, wasn't as bad as David's sins. So he basically disobeyed God with the, in the command what Samuel had given him, and he burned a, an offering too soon, and then he, um, a later he didn't um, destroy all of the cattle and save the king of the Amalekites, uh, which didn't seem as bad as murder and adultery, but he didn't repent. He basically only repented of the consequences. Or the examples of Judas and Peter, so Judas appeared to have been a faithful disciple right up until the very end uh, when his true colors were, um, were revealed. And so he, he's be his name has become synonymous with being a traitor. Um, so the last group had promising beginnings, but in the end, selfishness, pride, and self-indulgence won out. The second group, the fiery trials, brought out the gold that existed in their characters, and they prevailed with God and man, as did Jacob. Um, so, uh, in, in the end, I think it's our choice whether we choose to let the crucible of purification be towards our edification or towards our destruction. So, I think we should all choose edification and purification and not destruction and annihilation. So, with that, we'll move on to the Definitely. next day. Definitely, let's choose the gold and silver, not the dross. <laughs> That's right. All righty, Barbara, crucibles of maturity. I can't All wait right. to hear about this. This is that well, refined Christian. <clears throat> yeah, we're going to go with that. Well, the, the refined Christian is a refining process. And we're going to see that in the life of Paul here. And we're going to start with uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 7. And it says... And lest I should be exalted above measure by abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. So as we walk through this, this mature life, God works with us. If, if you've ever been a farmer and you've had, I'm, I'm going to talk about like my parents' grapevines. They cut them way back every year so that they get these beautiful clumps of, of grapes every year. In fact, I was there last fall and I said, are you sure you should cut them back that far? My mom goes, don't worry. But that's what God does to us. Also, there's this concept of cutting down. And the cutting down is more about <clears throat> completely destroying the plant. But when we prune the plants, we want, we, we want to develop their fruitfulness. But the interesting thing about both procedures, whether it's cutting down or pruning, both involve a sharp knife or a sharp object. So, um, so we see this as gardeners, and God also uses some of these same principles in our lives. So let's look again here at this verse 12, 7. So many have wondered what Paul actually meant by the, a thorn in the flesh. So let's, let's delve into that. <clears throat> so there's ideas that range from Paul being under constant attack from enemies to having a speech difficulty. It seems that it was actually a problem with his eyesight. And that is one of the, the areas that uh, Ellen White talks about. So let me read this to you from the Bible Commentary, Volume 6. The Apostle Paul was highly honored of God being taken in holy vision to the third heaven, where he looked upon scenes whose glorious glories might not have revealed, be revealed to mortals. Yet all this did not lead to boastfulness or self-confidence. He realized the importance of constant watchfulness and self-denial and plainly declares, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be cast away. Paul had a bodily affliction. His eyesight was bad. 
He thought that by earnest prayer, the difficulty might be removed. The Lord had his own purpose, and he said to Paul, Speak to me no more of this matter. My grace is sufficient for you. It, shall bear, it, it will enable you to bear the infirmity. So we see that sometimes God allows infirmities to actually keep us on the right path. And that's what he did to Paul. And I find interesting, find it interesting that was Paul, Paul's eyesight because if you look at Paul's life, what, he was shipwrecked three times. He was beaten, <laughs> I don't know how many times. He was put in jail and he was run out of town. And so <laughs> those things seemed to be a matter of course with him, but the thing that seemed to bother him the most was this eyesight. And so, again, I want to, want to reinforce that this thorn had a definite purpose. And because he said that a messenger of Satan to buffet me, this whole issue of a messenger of Satan to buffet him, lest I be exalted. So God had to do something. He, God understood Paul. He had to do something to keep him humble. <clears throat> and so it was not because of any specific sin he had committed, but to prevent him from sinning. So sometimes these things come into our lives to keep us from sinning. Paul recognized that by nature he had a weakness to sin and that thorn could guard against it. But he used Satan here to, to uh, <laughs> a messenger of Satan to do this work. So it's easy to overlook the portion of scripture that, that tells us here that Paul was afflicted. And this whole concept of a me messenger of Satan to buffet me, when you look at the term buffet, it means to really repeatedly strike or violently batter. So it gives you this image of these waves constantly and mercifully battering against a ship at sea that's, that's in, in a huge storm. And so we see this constant battering kept him humble and in constant, in, in contact with Christ, his source of strength. So sometimes in our lives when we are routinely attacked, it is for the purpose of something that we need in our lives to keep us on track with God. In 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, moving on with the scripture, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength has made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon us. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. That's one that we, that, that's, a, that's a portion of scripture that we need to incorporate in our, like, our own lives. We take pleasure in our infirmities in our reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, I am strong. Do we take pleasures in our infirmities? No. I think I hear myself grumble many times when I am reproached or persecuted or distressed. But the Bible says we need to take pleasure in that. And God has given us instruction on how we deal with Satan. Look at James 4, 7. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The other thing that we need to look at is what's, what's before us. During the final days of her history, Satan's going to send forth three demonic spirits who will delude and control the overwhelming majority of the powers of the inhabitants of the earth. And so... <clears throat> We'll have to choose sides in this battle. And as we do that, we know that God will be with us, will be with us through it. And these, um, as, as we're getting ready for battle, again, we go back to James 4, 7, we resist the devil. But there is good news in all of this. And Daniel 12, 1 says that Michael will stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of his people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, 
even the ones that shall be found written in the book. So we're going to see some overwhelming delusions. We're going to see overwhelming attacks. And so in our day-to-day -day lives, God is preparing us for the battles that could be ahead of us. For and the crucibles ahead? For the crucibles ahead, yeah. He's, he's, this, this, this delusion he's going to bring about, if possible, will deceive um, the, the very elect. Thessalonians 2, 3, 9, 10, and 12 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for the day shall come, except there be a falling away first, that the man of sin be revealed and the son of perdition, even them whose coming is after the workings of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of righteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. So we see that the Savior, in, according to Desire of Ages, is by the side of his tempted and tried ones. With him there can be no such thing as failure, impossibility or defeat we can do all things through christ who strengthens us when temptation and tri trials come do not wait to adjust to the, all the difficulties but look to jesus as your helper and you will find the more you spend in time in god's doing god's work the heavier the trials so yeah. you have to be prepared satan is more eager to break that bond he is scott do you have any final comments I wanted to add this one. This was something we went over in a previous lesson when we were talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. So th this is, I wanted to point out kind of how Jacob overcame. It says, he, that is Jacob, had power over the angel and prevailed through humiliation, repentance, and self-surrender, this sinful, erring mortal prevailed with the majesty of heaven. He had fastened his trembling grasp upon the promises of God, and the heart of infinite love could not turn away the sinner's plea. As an evidence of his triumph and an encouragement to others to imitate his example, his name was changed from one that was a reminder of his sin to one that, was a commem that commemorated his victory. And the fact that Jacob prevailed with God was an assurance that he would prevail with men. He no longer feared to encounter his brother's anger, for the Lord was his defense. So anyway, I wanted to leave us with that thought, which is that through humiliation, repentance, and self-surrender, we too could succeed. And so I'll leave us with that thought. Nice. Thank you very much, Scott. Okay, I'd like to read something from Ellen White. It's the... Help in Daily Living, page three. To live such a life, to exert such an influence, cost at every step effort, self-sacrifice, discipline. It is because they do not understand this that many are so easily discouraged in the Christian life. Many who sincerely consecrate their lives to God's service are surprised and disappointed to find themselves as never before confronted by obstacles and beset by trials and perplexities. They pray for Christ-likeness of character, for a fitness for the Lord's work, and they are placed in circumstances that seem to call forth all evil of their nature. Well, oh boy, I want to emphasize that. They're placed in circumstances that seem to call forth all the evil of their nature. Faults are revealed of which they did not even suspect existed. Like Israel of old, they question, if God is leading us, why do all these things come upon us? It is because God is leading them that these things come upon them. Trials and obstacles are the Lord's chosen methods of discipline and his appointed conditions of success. He who reads the hearts of men knows their characters better than they themselves know them. He sees that some have powers and susceptibilities which, rightly directed, might be used in advancement of his work. In his providence, he brings these persons into 
different positions and varied circumstances that they may discover in their character the defects which have been concealed from their own knowledge. He gives them opportunity to correct these defects and to fit themselves for his service. Often he permits the fires of affliction to assail them that they may be purified. Like the analogy earlier, it's burning that carnal flesh right out of us and fitting us for heaven. Have you ever been at the point to where you realize something about yourself you never knew? Especially a certain sin or something like that? And the closer you get to God, these things become apparent? That is this. But he is preparing you for a place where none of those things will exist. So do you look with joy towards the crucibles to come? Do you look at them and say, Lord, what are you trying to show me that needs to change in myself? And can we listen to God enough to even avoid some of these without the pain and suffering that we might choose him and to follow his ways wholeheartedly? That would be the petition for each and every one of us. And with that thought, let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, you came down to us in this sinful world. Lord, you came down to us in a horrible state that we're in because you love us, because you want to see the best for us. And even, Lord, even though we don't know any better at times or it doesn't seem apparent to us, you know what is best for us. Help us, Lord, to set aside self, to set aside pride or whatever it may be that blocks us from you, Lord, whatever those cherished darling sins are that Ellen White call, as Ellen White calls them, that may be separating us from you, that we might be wholeheartedly with you, Lord, in the crucibles that we do encounter, Lord, help us to understand what their purpose are, that we might understand your divine will, and Lord, that we might work diligently to purge ourselves from those things that, Lord, that dross that is within us, that you might refine us, Lord, to the golden image of Christ, that perfection that only can be wrought through the Holy Spirit and Jesus, our Savior. We pray that each one of, each person watching, Lord, that the Holy Spirit might touch their hearts and that they might have that kindled fire to move closer to you to persevere through these trials and to come out freshly molded and purified, ultimately to be the sons and daughters of the living God. That is a prayer for each and every person watching and for everyone here, that we might come home with you someday, Lord, and see just what we've been missing. We thank you and praise your glorious name, our Father in heaven, Jesus, our Redeemer and Savior, and the Holy Spirit, our Helper. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, Lord. Amen. Amen. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.